I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about really good emails, detecting credit cards in JavaScript, markdown editing, and more. Let's check it out. First up is really good emails, which just- That's all the emails I send. <laughs> just as the name implies, this is a website dedicated to Jason's emails. No, actually, it's- Oh, don't it, scroll down. It's a website for really great marketing emails. And look at that, Treehouse is up at the top. That's really all you need to know about this site. Yeah. Uh, no, on the left side here, they have a bunch of different categories for different types of marketing emails that you might send. For example, if you're onboarding new users, uh, you might send them an email welcoming them to the site. So here's a couple of examples of how that works from Flow and from MailChimp. Uh, if we go back here, you'll see that there's quite a few on this site uh, that you can check out and it has uh, continuous loading here, or lazy loading, so you can just scroll through these. Not a whole lot to say about this site, but if you're trying to write maybe a newsletter or an onboarding email or maybe a support email, there's some pretty good examples on this site and you should definitely check it out. And then you'll know how to send really good email like me. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a blog post from Joyant on handling errors in Node.js. This is actually a bit more complicated than it might seem at first, so let's go through and take a look at some of the things. This is actually an extremely long article, so we're not going to get into everything. Uh, but uh, it can be really difficult to handle certain errors in Node.js. So this post goes through and breaks down the different kinds of errors that you might encounter. For example, operational errors versus programming errors. Now, this is going to be an example of, let's say, something like you're doing a DNS call, and operationally, your server can't uh, figure out what the DNS address or the IP address is, or query the DNS server. Well, that's not going to be programmer error. That's going to be an operational error. And in that case, sometimes all that you can do is just log the error and move on. Um, this blog post takes the stance that for programmer errors, sometimes it's better to just have your app fail, log that, and then have a different process that restarts it. So there's just a ton of different options and different types of errors that can happen inside of a Node.js application. Now, um, here is some of their suggestions for handling the operational errors that we talked about not handling or handling programmer errors, um, and even patterns for writing different functions and what you're going to do. Should you throw an error? Should you catch an error? Should you handle it in the callback or not? Anyway, this is an extremely detailed blog post. We don't have time to go through it all. Definitely check it out in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse, or search for us in iTunes. We are The Treehouse Show. Nice. Well, next up is refills. And refills are. I could go for a refill on this show. Refills are prepackaged patterns and components built on top of bourbon, bitters, and meat. It all sounds delicious. It does. Uh, bourbon, if you're not familiar with it. Oh, I'm familiar with it. Is a simple and lightweight mix in library for SAS. And of course, bitters and neat go very well with bourbon, both the framework and beverage. Uh, if we scroll down here, you can see exactly what the site is all about. They have these different design patterns such as navigation or a hero unit or icon bullet points. And if you click on the button show code, you can see exactly what the markup looks like for this example, as well as the SAS that you can just go ahead and click copy and it will copy it to your clipboard and you can use it on your site. If you click over here on the left, you can get to the navigation to drop in directly into any one of these patterns. And they also have components a little bit further down. So if you need something a little bit smaller, such as a modal window or a sliding menu or badges and so forth, you can use some of these components. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bourbon, I highly recommend you check it out and try out some of these uh, patterns. Oh I, oh, I think I will check it out, Nick. I think I'll check out some bourbon. 
Next up, we have a post on how to correctly detect credit card types. Uh, this is actually a little bit more in depth than you might think at first. And this is a post that goes through avoiding the common mistakes when you're trying to implement credit card type detection. Now, it gives you the different card types and what the card number prefix will be. And then, hey, should I use a regular expression to detect these? Well, no, because now you have two problems. Uh, so, what does it say you should do? Well, it goes through and suggests using an inversion map to look at all of the different card types and then render it declaratively. Uh, now, it's also a bonus here. They tell you a pretty good user experience pattern when implementing a credit card form. Let's take a look at it here. So here is an example of the confusing card type user interface. So it wants you to enter a card number and then above it, okay, well, it accepts these cards. Do I have to click on the type of credit card I have? I don't know. Uh, I, I'll just post my credit card on Twitter and have somebody else do it for me. No, a, a better way of doing this type of form is having a text field for your credit card. And then right below that, it shows you which kind of cards are accepted. It removes the confusion of having to click on that. They're also dimmed quite a little bit. Now, uh, they do have a, a really nice user interface on here where it shows you the card number that you can enter along with the security code. And as you enter it, it shows on the bottom right what type of credit card it is. And also, you'll notice it uses combinations of bigger and smaller type to accomplish this. Anyway, this is a really good blog post. It goes a little bit more in depth than what I talked about, so definitely check it out. Very nice. Well, next up is font to width. And if you're familiar with the fittext.js project, uh, this one is actually very similar. And they do call out the fittext.js project, but they say, unlike other text fitting tools like fittext.js, font to width does not scale the font size. So if you're familiar with fittext.js, you'll know that that is uh, kind of a weird limitation of it uh, where it does scale the font size. Instead, this tries to use font variants. Now, I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself. What does this do? Well, it's great for titles that go across the width of a containing element. So, for example, we have shuffleboard standings across the top here, and it expands across the full width of this element. And then inside here, we have a ton of different names or different teams, I guess. Yeah, it looks like these are teams. And you'll notice that they have different lengths. So some of these are really short, some of them are really long, and they fill up the width of the container regardless of their length. And they do that, again, not by adjusting the font size, but they do it by adjusting the font variant. So they look for a variant that has uh, different uh, letter spacing or might be slightly taller and so on. So a couple notes about this. It's not meant for paragraph text, so it's just good for uh, headlines and other short pieces of text. And uh, yeah, shuffleboard pucks are called biscuits. Who knew? I didn't know, know that at all. Next up, we have a book that is right now for free. Uh, called Speaking JavaScript. This is written by Dr. Axel Rauschmeier. Now, the ebook is going to be available to buy online uh, by O'Reilly. Uh, you can also buy it in print starting March 7th, 2014, or 014, as we say on this show. But why are we talking about it here? Because they're not sponsoring the show. Well, there is a free online version in HTML. Uh, now, we're just going to take a look at the table of contents right here. Uh, it's, it's pretty wonderful. It goes through basic syntax of JavaScript, gives you the syntax, all the different built-in types, talks about functions, exception handling, and so much more. Uh, then it goes through, talks about why you would want to use JavaScript, what you should watch out for, what is elegant about JavaScript, hint, not much. It's a very short chapter. And then a little bit more of the history. Uh, finally, it goes into a little bit more depth in JavaScript, talks about the syntax, different values, operators, booleans, numbers. It's really just a great overview of the JavaScript language. If you're new to JavaScript, definitely recommend checking this out because it is free. Uh, it's very thorough and uh, easy to learn. Very nice. Well, next is Epic Editor. Sounds and pretty epic. I do have to say, it is pretty epic. I'm pretty impressed by this. It's an embeddable 
JavaScript Markdown Editor. So if you're familiar with Markdown, it's basically this syntax where you can use maybe like a pound sign like this and it will turn this into a headline or you can use maybe underscores and turn this text into italics and so on. So there's a bunch of different little language tokens here where you can format text. And if we click the preview button down in the bottom right, you can see exactly what this text is going to look like. So like I said, there's the headline and there's the italicized text. Pretty fast. You can also go full screen with this. So look at that. Wow, it uses the full screen API for browsers. And you can edit text on the left and see the preview on the right. So that's pretty handy. And yeah, like you said, Jason, it is pretty fast. It's uh, pretty amazing that they're doing this. So why would you want to do this? Well, this uh, Markdown language is actually used in a number of different places across the internet and uh, most WYSIWYG editors are not very good. So it's really nice to have one that uh, actually does seem to look pretty great. To use it, you just go ahead and download it off of GitHub. You create your container element just like this and then you add the epic editor.js file and you just initialize it and it should take care of the rest. But if you want to get more into it, there is an API so you can go ahead and check that out. All right, very, very cool. I'd say it's, it is epic. It does, it does earn its moniker. Hmm. Finally, we have a blog post on debugging asynchronous JavaScript with the Chrome DevTools. Wow. Yeah, this is a brand new feature in the latest builds of Chrome Canary, so you'll have to be on the really total bleeding edge to use it. But it lets you, like it says, asynchronously debug JavaScript with the Chrome DevTools. Now, why in the world would you want to do something like that? Well, it can be really difficult to get through and find an error in a function with JavaScript uh, when it's doing postbacks to the server and tons of different AJAX. So this is a wonderful blog post. It has animated GIFs uh, showing what exactly you can do when you enable the async functionality right here. And you can see the differences uh, later on in the post. Let's see. So they give an example of delayed timer events and responses. Really nice walkthrough of what's going on in Gmail. Say, all right, oops, the system encountered a problem, retrying now. Well, here is a nice little breakdown of how that happens. And without the async handling, all you get with your debugging is seeing these few different steps in the code. Now, if you do enable the async functionality, you can go a lot farther back in the stream and see exactly what happened before the HTTP request went out when it came back, all the different call stack and places that it went through when that happened. Now, in addition to just this, it shows you how to watch the expressions asynchronously, uh, even evaluating code from past scopes. Isn't that awesome? It's basically like time travel in your browser. In fact, they even use a nice little, uh, little Doctor Who TARDIS there to uh, unravel that. Now, this doesn't support JavaScript promises just yet, but that is coming soon. Anyway, this So you could say they're promising support for that. You could say that if you were awesome. So anyway, yeah, uh, great blog post. Definitely recommend checking this out because it really does make debugging so much easier. Very nice stuff. Well, I am at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Seifer. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse. You can also check them out in iTunes. Search for us. We are The Treehouse Show. And by the way, if you like this show and want to sign up for Treehouse, use the code at the bottom of this video to get a free one month trial. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com and use that link to get a free month. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week.